Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. In our last episode we spoke about the spiritual development of the Prophet. We mentioned that <clears throat> from a very young age the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi used to hear the angels, angels would communicate to him, but he was not able to see them. Uh, when he was awake and then as he progressed as he became older he started to see the angel Gabriel in his dreams so he was a muhaddath uh, when he was young meaning that he was spoken to by angels and then <clears throat> when he became a prophet at the age of 40 he began seeing visions of angels in his dreams. And as we mentioned in our last episode, the Quran, the Quranic verses were began being revealed to him when he was at the age of 43. And inshallah, we'll get into uh, to more of that detail in this episode. Now the Prophet ﷺ, for the majority of his adult life, he used to practice what was known as tahannuth. And tahannuth is basically a devotional practice. It's a, it's a meditative type of solitude where the Prophet would leave the, the hustle and the bustle of the city and he would seclude himself in his favorite cave on his favorite mountain which used to overlook the valley of Mecca. Tahannuth was a tradition that was established by the Prophet's uh, paternal grandfather Abdul Muttalib. He also used to go to the cave of Hira and meditate and reflect on the purpose of life, his role in creation and he would uh, spend time worshiping the the transcendent reality which is god now some ulama have said that the word tahannuth comes from the word hinth the word hinth is an arabic word which means the violation of an oath and the word hinth essentially became synonymous with sin and therefore, tahannuth means to do something to protect yourself from sin. So this meditative seclusion was a type of spiritual exercise that Abdul Muttalib used to uh, practice. And now we see that the Prophet from a, from a young age, for the, the, the majority of his adult life, he would venture out and meditate in that cave. And keep in mind, the Prophet ﷺ, you know, he grows up with Bedouins. And I can imagine that when he lived in Mecca, he must have felt alienated from, from nature and venturing out and seeking out the cave of Hira was a way for him to reconnect with, uh, with nature, with the creation of God. Now the Prophet ﷺ used to go to the cave of Hira. Uh, sometimes he would go in the month of Ramadan. He would go sometimes with his family. And at other times he would go by himself. He would take some barley porridge and water that used to be prepared uh, by Khadija. And he would head uh, for the hills. Now, you know, why did he enjoy this type of solitude? You know, as we've mentioned, this provided the Prophet an opportunity to separate himself from the worldly distractions that he's surrounded by uh, when he's in Mecca. It also provides him with much needed time to contemplate the signs and favors of God and to praise Him. And the cave of Hira also offers a spectacular view 
of Mecca and specifically it gave him a very beautiful uh, view of the Kaaba itself. Uh, when I first went uh, to Mecca, uh, when I performed the Hajj when I was 18, I remember climbing that mountain and I actually entered the cave of Hira. And one of the most striking things that I noticed about the cave was that it actually overlooked the, uh, the Kaaba. It overlooked the entire valley of Mecca. And it just gave me the impression that it's, it's as though the Prophet was waiting for this divine uh, calling. So the Prophet ﷺ, he used to go to the cave of Hira to separate himself from the worldly distractions. He would spend time worshipping and contemplating. And he also did so because he felt deeply distressed by the corruption he witnessed. And he needed time to contemplate about how to bring about the necessary social reforms. Mecca, in the Prophet's mind, was, was toxic because of the corruption, because of the, the social ills. And that private time, that solitude, gave him the opportunity to reflect on what needed to change in Mecca. In, in Nahjul Balagha, in Sermon 192, we find that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, actually mentions that on many occasions, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib would accompany the Prophet when he would go to the cave of Hira. In Sermon 192 of Nahjul Balagha, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, وَلَقَدْ كَانَ يُجَاوِرُ فِي كُلِّ سَنَةٍ بِحِرَى Every year, he used to go in seclusion to the cave of Hira. So this was something that was ongoing. You know, this was not a phase in the Prophet's life. It was, you know, every year he would dedicate time to this, uh, this meditative solitude. فَأَرَاهُ وَلَا يَرَاهُ غَيْرِي he would go into seclusion in the cave of Hira, the Imam says, where I saw him, but no one else saw him. Meaning that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib would accompany him and it was only the Prophet and Ali. And of course, as we mentioned, you know, the fact that you know, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib joined the household of Khadija and the Prophet when he was you know, maybe five or six years old, so it's, it's very possible that when Ali ibn Abi Talib was five, six, seven years old, he would join the Prophet and spend uh, days, if not weeks, up in that uh, mountain. In those days, the Imam says, in those days, Islam did not exist in any house except that of the Prophet of God, peace and blessings of God be upon him and his descendants, and Khadija, while I was the third after these two. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, I used to see the light of the revelation and message and smell the fragrance of prophethood. So it seems that from this statement of Ali ibn Abi Talib that he, you, he would see what the Prophet would, was witnessing. He would hear what the Prophet would hear. That he saw the light of revelation and he could smell the fragrance of prophethood. Now, contrary to popular belief, the Prophet ﷺ does not receive revelation, Quranic revelation, when he's 40. He actually receives the first revelation in the cave of Hira when he's 43. And he receives it in the month of Ramadan. So again, unfortunately, the popularized narrative is that the Prophet receives the first five verses of Surah Al-Alaq 
in the month of Rajab, in the 27th of Rajab. However, when you look at the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt, you find that they clearly indicate that the Qur'an was revealed over a span of 20 years. We know the Prophet dies at the age of 63. And for, for, it, for revelation to continue for 20 years would mean that revelation begins at the age of 43. Now, as we mentioned in our last episode, the Prophet becomes his nubuwa, his prophethood, begins at the age of 40. And then the first ayat of the Qur'an are revealed when he's 43, and they're revealed in the month of Ramadan, in the year 613, Common Era. And as many of you know, the, the verses that are revealed are Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Iqra' bism rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, Iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram, الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم. Read in the name of your Lord who created. Created man from a dangling clot. Read for your most gracious Lord, who taught the use of the pen, has hereby taught man what he did not know. Now, so the narrations mention that at the age of 43, and as we indicated in our previous sessions, that initially Israfil was appointed uh, as the caretaker of the Prophet, that he conveyed certain things to the Prophet. And then after three years, at the age of 43, Jibra'il is assigned to the Holy Prophet. Now, another thing that happens in the month of Ramadan at the age of 43 is the Qur'an in its entirety is revealed. So the Qur'an in its totality is revealed in this in the year in the, the year 613 common era. So when the Prophet is 43, he receives the first five verses of Surah Al-Alaq. And on the night of Qadr, he receives the Qur'an it's in, in its totality. So the Qur'an was revealed in the month of Ramadan as the Qur'an itself attests to. So in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 185, Allah says, شَهْرُ Ramadan الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ Quran." So the previous verse was speaking about fasting. The designated days of the fast are the month of Ramadan in which the Qur'an was revealed. Now, the Qur'an is revealed in the month of Ramadan, but it's revealed on a specific night. In Surah 44, ayah number 3, Allah says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatin mubarakah. We sent it down during a blessed night. Now, what is that blessed night? It's the night of Qadr, as we read in Surah Al-Qadr, Surah 97, ayah number 1. Now, where was the Qur'an sent down on the night of decree? The night of decree is, the, the, is Laylat al-Qadr. We have different narrations that mention different places the Qur'an was revealed uh, on the night of Qadr. So we have some riwayat, some narrations that mention that the Qur'an was sent down to Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur. Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur is the inhabited house. This is essentially the Kaaba for the inhabitants of the heavens. And it is it is uh, parallel with uh, the Kaaba. The narration is from Hafs ibn Ghiyath, one of the companions of Imam al-Sadiq. عن أبي عبد الله عليه السلام قال سألته عن قول الله عز وجل حفص بن غياث he says I asked Abu Abdullah الصادق he asked the sixth Imam about God's statement 
شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن So Hafs ibn Ghiyath, he says, I came to Imam al-Sadiq asking him about this Quranic verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, which says that the designated fast of the month are the month of are the month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed. So here Hafs ibn Ghiyath is saying that it seems that there's a contradiction here. The Quran states that the Quran was revealed in the month of Ramadan, whereas it was actually revealed over 20 years from its beginning to its end. So again, I draw your attention to the number 20 here. If the first verses of the Quran were revealed upon the Prophet when he was 40, that would mean that the Quran was revealed over a period of 23 years. Whereas here and in other narrations, it mentions 20 years, which indicates and proves that the Prophet receives the first verses of the Qur'an at the age of 43. In any case, Imam al-Sadiq answers, فَقَالَ أَبُوْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ نَزَلَ الْقُرْآنُ جُمْلَةً وَاحِدَ فِي شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ إلى البيت المعمور ثم نزل في طول عشرين سنة The Imam said the Quran came down as a whole in the month of Ramadan to البيت المعمور to that the inhabited house which is the Kaaba for the inhabitants of the uh, of, of, for the inhabitants of the heavens and then it came down across 20 years. So again, the Imam doesn't correct Hafs ibn Ghiyath. He doesn't say, you know, it was revealed over 23 years. There's an understanding that the Quranic revelation took, period, took a place over a period of 20 years. So the first opinion is that the Quran was revealed in the month of Ramadan at one time to Al-Bayt al-Ma'mur. And then the gradual revelation was from Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur to the Prophet. That's one opinion. The second opinion is that the Qur'an was revealed in its totality to the heart of the Prophet. So for instance, in Surah Al-Shu'ara, Surah 26, verses 192 to 195, we read, وَإِنَّهُ لَتَنْزِيلُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنْدِرِينَ بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍّ مُبِينَ And indeed, it is a revelation of the Lord of the worlds. The trustworthy spirit, meaning Jibra'il, has brought it down upon your heart, O Muhammad. So the Quran, when it was sent down in its in its complete form, it was sent down to the heart of the Prophet. It descended to the purest place in Alam dunya which is none other than the Qalb, the heart of the Prophet. And then, of course, it was revealed gradually over a span of twenty-three year, a span of twenty years, as we read in Surat. Al-Isra, verse 106. Wa We have divided the book into parts so that you may recite it for people gradually and we sent it down piecemeal. So the Quran was instantaneously revealed to the heart of the Prophet and then the Qur'an, Jibra'il descends upon the Prophet and signals to him which verses to reveal to the people. And this is why in Surah 75, verses 16 to 18, Allah tells the Prophet not to be hasty in reciting the Qur'an. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به Move not your tongue with it, O Muhammad, to hasten with its recitation. Inna alayna jam'ahu wa qur'ana fa'idha qara'nahu fattabi' qur'ana. Indeed, upon us, meaning upon God, is its compilation and its recitation. So when we have, so when we have recited it through Gabriel, then follow its recitation. Meaning, do not recite the Qur'an to the people until Jibra'il gives you the okay, until Jibra'il gives you the green light, which highlights that the Prophet, that the knowledge of the Qur'an was already in the heart of the Prophet. The, the realities of the Qur'an were already infused into the heart of the Prophet, and over these 23 years, the role of Jibra'il is essentially to reveal to the Prophet what part of the Qur'an which is embedded in his heart is to be shared with the public. Now, one of the points with respect to the first revelation that is, that, uh, that is noteworthy is that when you, when you read some of the books of Hadith, particularly in the Sunni tradition, you find that the Prophet's experience in the cave of Hira, when Gabriel descended upon him, was that of bewilderment and confusion. The Prophet is portrayed in Sahih al-Bukhari as a man who simply did not know what was happening to him. A man who doubted whether he was even sane or not, who doubted what was being communicated to him. And inshallah, we'll go through uh, this narration uh, that is found in Bukhari, and inshallah, I'll provide uh, some commentary and we'll point out why we in the Shia tradition doubt the authenticity of this report. <clears throat> so the narration is from عن عروة ابن الزبير عن عائشة أم المؤمنين. So the narration is from عروة ابن الزبير from Aisha, and I'll just read the the English translation for the sake of time because it is a very lengthy uh, tradition. So Aisha says, the commencement of the divine inspiration or the divine revelation to the messenger of God was in the form of good dreams which came true like bright daylight. So the Prophet ﷺ, before Jibra'il descends with the first revelation, the Prophet was receiving divine inspiration in the form of dreams. And we also mentioned that this is what is what we have in, uh, in, the Shi in Shia hadith sources, where the Prophet, before the, before the first revelation, he sees angels in his dream. He sees Jibra'il in his dreams. So the commencement of the divine inspiration to the Messenger of God was in the form of good dreams, which came true like bright daylight. Anything that the Prophet would see in his dreams would materialize in the real world. And then the love of seclusion was bestowed upon him. The Prophet ﷺ, yes, he was a social person, but he enjoyed seclusion. He enjoyed being alone. He used to go in seclusion in the cave of Hira, where he used to worship continuously for many days before his desire to see his family. He used to take with him, he used to take with him the journey food for the stay. And then came back, and then come back to his wife to take his food likewise again. So Aisha says he would go, he would take some provisions with him. When he would run out of food, he would return to Khadija and she would provide him with, uh, with more food so he can go back to his, his, uh, his meditative solitude. Till suddenly the truth descended upon him while he was in the cave of Hira. 
the angel came to him and asked him to read. The prophet replied, I do not know how to read. The prophet added, the angel caught me forcefully and pressed me so hard that I could not bear it anymore. He then released me and again asked me to read. And I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he caught me again and pressed me a second time till I could not bear it anymore. He then released me and again asked me to read. But again I replied, I do not know how to read or what shall I read? Thereupon he caught me for the third time and pressed me and then released me and said, Read in the name of your Lord, who has created all that exists, created man from a clot. Read, and your Lord is the most generous. And the first five verses of Surah Al-Alaq. Aisha continues saying, Then the Messenger of God returned with the inspiration and with his heart beating severely. Then he went to Khadija bint Khuwaylid and said, Cover me. Cover me. The Prophet was presumably shaking from, from terror. He was terrified. They covered him till his fear was over. And after that, he told her everything that had happened and said, I fear that something may happen to me. So if you look at many of the, the narrations, it highlights that the Prophet thought that maybe he was possessed by a jinn, by a devil. And... In this narration, you see that Khadija tries to reassure the Prophet. So the Prophet is, is doubtful. He doesn't know what's happening to him. Khadija then says, never. By God, God will never disgrace you. So the Prophet basically tells her that maybe I'm being punished. Maybe I'm possessed. Maybe I've lost my mind. Khadija says, never. By God, God will never disgrace you. You keep good relations with your kin. You help the poor and the destitute. You serve your guests generously. And you assist the deserving calamity afflicted ones. So you're you're a good person. That you would you're not you would God would not allow you to be possessed by a devil or a jinn, nor is God punishing you. But apparently, according to this tradition, it wasn't enough that the Prophet was still shaken, he was confused. Khadija then accompanied him to her cousin Waraka ibn Nawfa, who during the pre-Islamic period became a Christian and he used to write the writing with Hebrew letters. He would write, so this is Aisha speaking, he would write from the gospel in Hebrew as much as Allah wished him to write. He was an old man and had lost his eyesight. Khadija said to Waraka, listen to the story of your nephew, you know, because, you know, they're, they're distant cousins. Listen to the story of your nephew. Waraka said, oh my nephew, he's now speaking to the Prophet who is completely bewildered, he's confused, he's shaken up by this experience. Oh my nephew, he says, what have you seen? The Messenger of God described whatever he had seen. Waraka said, This is the same one who keeps the secrets, the angel Gabriel, whom God sent to Moses. I wish I were young and could live up to the time when your people would turn you out. So, it's Waraka who's explaining to Rasulullah what's happening to him. The Prophet doubts, he doesn't even believe what's happening to him, he's not sure. Aisha says that a Christian monk confirms to the Prophet that, no, 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 you're not possessed by a jinn, Ya Rasulullah. This is what happened to Moses. This is the angel Gabriel who seized you. And he says that I wish that I could live long enough to, to witness you in your, in your heyday, basically. And this is where the Messenger of God asked, Will they drive me out? Are my people going to drive me out because of the message that I'm going to deliver to them? Waraka replied in the affirmative and said, Anyone who came with something similar to what you have brought was treated with hostility. 
And if I should remain alive till the day when you will be turned out, then I would support you strongly. But after a few days, Waraka died, and the divine inspiration was also paused for a while. Furthermore, in, in Kitab al-Ta'bir, there's a section in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, which is dedicated to the interpretation of dreams. And a part of the narration relates to Nuzul al-Wahi. It relates to the first revelation. And here, it says that the Prophet was so terrified by the experience that he was suicidal. So the narration says, So after a few days of the Prophet sharing this story with him, his experience in the cave of Hira, he, the waraka dies. The revelation was suspended. حتى حزن النبي صلى الله عليه وآله فيما بلغنا حزنا غدا منه مرارا كي يتردى من رؤوس شواهق الجبال. So the narrator says that it was conveyed to us that the Prophet, after the death of Waraka, after revelation was suspended, the Prophet became so sad. So sad as we have heard that he intended several times to throw himself from the tops of high mountains. And every time he went up the top of a mountain in, or, in order to throw himself, Gabriel Jibra'il would appear before him. So whenever the Prophet was on the verge of committing suicide, Jibra'il would appear and say, O oh Muhammad, you are indeed God's messenger in truth. Which indicates, which highlights here that according to this report in Bukhari, the Prophet was still in doubt about whether he was a Prophet or not. He was suicidal. So Jibra'il consoles the Prophet, tries to calm him down. O oh Muhammad, you are indeed God's messenger in truth. Whereupon his heart would become quiet and he would calm down and would return home. So Jibra'il essentially talks the Prophet out of committing suicide. And whenever the period of the coming of the inspiration used to become long, he would do as before. So let, and so the Prophet had this habit, according to this narration, where if Jibra'il doesn't appear for a few days, if there are no ayat of the Qur'an, he would go to a mountain and he would attempt to throw himself off the mountain. And then Jibra'il would intervene and say, O oh Muhammad, you are a messenger of God. You are really a messenger of God. Don't take your life. And so on and so forth. Now, the problems with this narrative. Now again, the first narration that is transmitted by Aisha is accepted by by Sunnis. The narration that mentions his attempted suicide is not accepted by all Sunnis. Some say that this is not an authentic uh, report. Some say that it is. So there's ikhtilaf on that issue. Now, the problems with this narrative. If you recall, the narration in Bukhari that explains in detail the Prophet's experience with the first revelation is narrated by Urwa ibn Zubair. Urwa ibn Zubair, who is married to Aisha's sister. So there's a, there's a family connection there. Now, the narrations that mention the Prophet being confused and bewildered uh, with uh, in the cave of Hira and he was unsure about whether he was a prophet or not. Most of the traditions that are the source of this narrative come through the house of Zubair. They are Zubairis. And the house of Zubair had family ties to Khadija and Waraka, the Christian monk. So again, the narration that we mentioned is transmitted by Urwa ibn Zubair 
from Aisha, and he was married to Aisha's sister, Asma. Another transmitter of such reports is Ismail uh, ibn Abi Hukayn. He's an ally, a supporter of the house of Zubair. Wahab ibn Kaysan, he's also an ally of the house of Zubair. Abdullah ibn Zubair from Ubaid, so Zubair ibn Awam. So the, these narrations come from the house of Zubair. Now why is this significant? And why does this warrant doubt on our part about the authenticity? Number one, we have to remember that the house of Zubair, the Zubairis were contenders for the Khilafah after Karbala. And if you want to make a case for yourself that you are qualified, that you are deserving for the uh, deserving deserving of the Khilafah, you have to possess certain merits that set you apart from others. And the way that they did this is they likely tried to aggrandize the role of their kinsfolk in the first revelation. So the Zubairis, the house of Zubair, it seems that they tried to bolster their status by essentially hinting that it was a member of our family, a relative who reassured the Prophet that he was an act actually a Prophet. So the house of Zubair has family ties to Waraka. And this is where you have the story of Waraka who essentially gives the Prophet confidence that, you know, don't doubt yourself, O Muhammad. You are indeed a messenger of God. So, so you have the Zubairis, they have this, potentially this motive to present themselves and their ancestors as important players in the early days of Islam and who, who essentially, uh, whose relatives gave the Prophet the boost in confidence to continue his message. Now another problem with this narrative is that it portrays the Prophet as being uncertain and doubtful about his own mission. And this of course contradicts what we know rationally about Prophets. What do we mean? How can we be expected to, to believe in a prophet who does not believe in himself? So how can we be expected to be certain to have yaqeen if the prophet himself was not certain? So this is an epistemological dilemma that if it is obligatory upon us to believe in the nubuwa of the Prophet, how can this be a requirement when the Prophet himself had doubts about the legitimacy of his own nubuwa? Now, this also contradicts the Qur'an because the Qur'an explicitly states that the Prophet ﷺ was endowed with insight and certainty with respect to his mission. In Surah Yusuf, verse 108, Allah says to the Prophet, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Say, this is my path. And Surah Yusuf is a Meccan surah. This is my path. I call to God I and those who follow me are with insight. Allah describes the Prophet as being someone who has basira. And this does not conform to the reports about the Prophet being bewildered and confused uh, with the, uh, the descent of revelation. In Surah Al-An'am we read, قُلْ إِنِّي عَلَى بَيِّنَةٍ مِّن رَبِّي Say, O Muhammad, I am with proof from my Lord. How can the Prophet be on bayina from his Lord if he, he has doubts that he's a Prophet and he has to go to a Christian monk to reassure him 
And then when Jibra'il doesn't appear and revelation is interrupted, according to the narration that we read, he tries to commit suicide. So the Quranic description of the Prophet is very different from the descriptions that we find in those narrations that speak about uh, the beginning of revelation. And it also contradicts what the Imams tell us about the nature of revelation. There's a, a question that Zurara, Zurara ibn A'yun, he asks Imam al-Sadiq. Zurara is one of the elite students of the fifth and sixth Imam. عن زرارة قال قلت لأبي عبد الله عليه السلام كيف لم يخف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله فيما يأتيه من قبل الله أن يكون ذلك مما ينزغ به الشيطان It's a very good question. زرارة asked Imam al-Sadiq How is it that the Messenger of God did not fear that what came to him from God might be insinuations from Satan. And this is what is implied in the hadith that is transmitted by Aisha. The Prophet comes down from the cave of Hira, he's trembling, he's confused, he's bewildered. He he asks Khadija that do you think that I'm possessed? And she she assures him that you're a man who looks after the orphans, that you're generous, you're kind, God would never disgrace you. Those who portray the Prophet in this way do not understand the nature of revelation. And Imam al-Sadiq explains here, when Zurara asks him, how is it that the Messenger of God did not fear that what came to him from God might be insinuations from Satan? فقال, the Imam salam responds, Imam al-Sadiq, إن الله إذا اتخذ عبدا رسولا أنزل عليه السكينة والوقار فكان فكان الذي يأتيه من قبل الله مثل الذي يراه بعينه. The Imam عليه السلام he says, when God makes a person a messenger. He sends down tranquility and certainty on him. Thereafter, what comes to him from God is as certain as what he sees. Imam al-Sadiq is essentially saying that revelation is not ambiguous. What Aisha mentions indicates that she does not understand the nature of revelation because you cannot be confused when God speaks to you. You cannot be confused when Jibra'il is revealing to you because when Allah chooses someone as a prophet, as a messenger, He sends down Sakina upon them. They are composed. They have Certainty, wiqar, certainty is infused into their hearts. When God sends a messenger, what does it say about God that the messenger himself doesn't know if God has sent him as a messenger? Divine justice, divine wisdom dictates that Allah would make the fact that this man is my prophet very clear to him. That there's no ambiguity. Because the nature of revelation itself is that revelation is light. Amir al muminin what does he say? Ara nur al wahi. I see, I saw the light of revelation. There's no ambiguity, there's no bewilderment. The Prophet knew exactly what happened to him. He did not need a Christian monk to reassure him. He did not doubt for a single moment that he was possessed by a jinn or a devil. Because Allah sent down sakina, tranquility and certainty on him. Because and what's what's striking is that when you look at the seerah of the Prophet, if this actually happened, don't you think the likes of Abu Sufyan and Abu Jahl would have used it against Rasulullah? In the Battle of Badr, Abu Sufyan would have said, Listen, 
You claim to be a messenger of God. Don't you remember that first, the first few days or the first weeks when you yourself doubted that you were a messenger of God? We don't have any reports from the enemies of the Prophet that mention this bewilderment or confusion during, those, during the beginning of Revelation. So the Imam السلام, he says that the way that the Prophet knew that this was not an insinuation of shaitan is because revelation itself is clear, it's light, and God sends his tranquility and certainty upon his Prophet. And what comes to him from Allah is as certain as what he sees with his own eyes. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. And inshallah, we will continue our discussion about what ha what transpired after the first revelation in our next episode. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad ajil farajahum. Any questions or comments? Can you please elaborate more on what Al Bayt al Mamul is, uh, the house where the Quran might have been revealed? So, Al Bayt al Mamul, <clears throat> from what we find in the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt, is that in the same way that the Kaaba is the direction of worship for the inhabitants of the earth, when we want to perform our daily prayers when we want to perform the formal acts of salah we direct we orient ourselves towards the kaaba now for the inhabitants of the heavens those who inhabit the samawat for them their direction of prayer is al baytul ma'mur and al baytul ma'mur is directly parallel to it is directly above the uh, the Kaaba, so it's a house of worship. Now, again, what is it made of? What is it, what is the nature of this uh, this uh, this structure? We don't know. What we know is that it is a place in which the inhabitants of the heavens they orient themselves towards that house of worship, in the same way that we orient ourselves to the Kaaba when we want to uh, perform. Our prayers, and it's 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 in a different realm. It's in a higher realm, meaning it's a plane of existence that has fewer limitations. You have to keep in mind that if you think of God's creation as a hierarchy, dunya is at the it's at the base. Dunya, this earthly material world, is the lowest level of existence. It's the lowest plane of existence. And therefore, and then you have the, 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 the heavens, the, the samawat, and al-bayt al-ma'mur is positioned in one of the heavens, and it's, it's, where, uh, it's the place where the inhabitants of the skies, they direct themselves for worship. And what might the significance of the Quran being revealed to that place be? I mean, it's a sanctified place. It's a holy place. Now, the Quran, because the Quran is the word of God, and it represents the knowledge of God. Tanzil, when we say the Quran is sent down, what that essentially means is that it has to be simplified and brought down and manifested in a way that's appropriate for this lower uh plane of existence. I'll give you an example. If you, if I have a book that's on the fourth floor of a building and I want to bring it down to the first floor, is the book going to change? No, because you're bringing something that's not that high to a lower position. So there's no change. If I a book that I have on the fourth floor of the building, if I send it down to the first floor, there is no change that happens in the book. Now, if I want to 
take, for example, a, a glass of water that's on the top of Mount Everest. Chances are it's cold up there and that water is gonna become ice. If I bring that cup of water from the tip of Mount Everest down to the ground, is the water gonna change? It's very possible that it's gonna melt because you, you brought it down from a very high place to a very low elevation. So because of that distance, there's gonna be a change. So we see that sometimes an object changes when you take it from a high place in dunya to a low place in dunya. Question, what type of change occurs when you take something from loh al mahfuz down to dunya? It has to undergo a lot of change. There's a process, there's a simplification that has to happen from some, for something to come from that those higher worlds down into the dunya. And this is why Allah says, we made it an Arabic Qur'an, which means Qur'an is not Arabic in its original form. The Qur'an in its original form doesn't even have letters, but is it is expressed in the Arabic language in the way that we see it today after it undergoes this process of tanzil. And part of the process of tanzil that it has to pass through, al-baytul ma'mum. That's just a very simple uh, answer to the question. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam. Thank you very much, Sheikh. It was very, very informative. Your presentation was excellent. Alhamdulillah, always. Uh, Sheikh, um, in the surah, wa duha, wa duha, wa layli da saja, ma wa da'aka rabbuka wa ma khala. So uh, Allah, after giving two khasams uh, of duha and layl, that is night, Allah says, uh, O Messenger, I have not forsaken you. Um, in the tafsir, um, we read that uh, the wahi had paused uh, for a few, uh, I think, um, for a certain uh, period of time. And then the Messenger of Islam was very restless and he was uh, kind of going through uh, depression that what has happened, you know, whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is radi with me or no. So that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, oh messenger, I have not forsaken you. Uh, so can you just shed some light on that, please? <clears throat> so Surah Al-Duha, and inshallah, I, I plan on speaking about this in our next episode about the revelation of, uh, of the surahs, because approximately 46 surahs are revealed in pretty rapid succession after the revelation of the first uh, few verses of Surah Al-Ala. Now with respect to Surah Al-Duha, when we speak about Fatratul Wahi, the suspension of Wahi, we have different accounts. Some say that revelation was suspended for a few days, and some mention even three years. But, and I'll, I'll go into more detail, uh, <clears throat> inshallah, in our next session. Why was revelation suspended? Some ulama have mentioned that it actually had nothing to do with the prophet. You know, it, it had to do with the fact that some who were around the prophet did not, uh, some ulama mentioned that some of the companions of the Prophet, some of those who were with the Prophet, did not maintain good hygiene. And, because, and if you want revelation, if you want the angelic realm world to come in contact with you, you have to be, you have to be pure, you have to be clean. So because the Prophet was surrounded by certain people who did not have good hygiene, some say that this is the reason why the, uh, the revelation was uh, suspended. But it seems that this was a test in the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested 
communities before, this could have also served as a, a test. And we know that this, the fact that revelation was suspended shook the faith of, uh, of some, where they started to have doubts. So it seems that this was a type of imtihan. It was a type of trial for, uh, for the believers to see if, if they would remain uh, devoted to the Messenger of God. But inshallah, in our next uh, uh, session, we'll speak about uh, the, the chronology of the surahs that were revealed uh, after uh, the first revelation, inshallah. Um, Thank you, Sheikh. And does the fact that uh, the, the there's there's two conflicting revelations of when the first set of verses were revealed, either at age forty or age forty three, so is there a similar um, disagreement about whether or not there were ver other verses revealed in the first, like between the ages of forty and forty three? So the stronger view is that there was there was no Quranic revelation between the ages of 40 and 43. The first verses, I'm, I'm speaking about the Shi'i tradition. According to the Ahadith of the Ahl al-Bayt, revelation begins at the age of 43. Now, there are some narrations that mention that Surah Al-Fatiha was revealed, was the first. Uh, they were the first uh, verses revealed to the Prophet. Others mentioned Surah Al-Alaq. Surah Al-Alaq seems to be uh, supported uh, by more evidence. But what we do know for a fact is that at the age of 43, the entire Quran was revealed to the heart of the Prophet. And <clears throat> inshallah, in our next session, I'll share with you the order, the chronology of the, uh, the surahs that were revealed. So the debate really is about whether it was the first five verses of Surah Al-Alaq or Surah Al-Fatiha when we're talking about the gradual revelation of the Qur'an to the people. There's no doubt, at least from what I've seen from the Ahadith, there's no doubt that the Qur'an in its totality was revealed to either Bayt al-Ma'mur or to the heart of the Prophet in the month of Ramadan at the age of 43. I'm just going to read this question verbatim. Uh, it seems this hadith that you were speaking of was from people who were not there with the messenger, nor could they have been. Is this a factor in, uh, uh, is this a factor of presence also a determining factor in the hadith's authenticity? There are verses in the Quran that says a mountain, etc., could not be the word of God or something like that. Could those verses be used to support this hadith you spoke of? So... <clears throat> So obviously, Aisha was not, she was not present when the, uh, in fact, she was not even alive <clears throat> when the, when Wahi came down upon the Prophet. She was definitely not there. Now, some would argue that that doesn't, that's not problematic because he could have shared the story of the first revelation with her. I think that when you look at the, the other transmitters of the hadith, namely the, the house of Zubair, they definitely have motive to, to fabricate and to aggrandize their role in reassuring the prophet that he is in fact a messenger of God. So one of the ways that we assess the authenticity of a hadith is to look and see if the narrators have any motive to lie and distort. So I'll give you an example. If someone, let's say that we know that a certain transmitter of hadith is a businessman, he's a merchant. And let's say that this narrator says that it is not haram to charge interest to relatives when you do, when you transact with them. Now, the fact that he's a merchant and stands to benefit from such a ruling automatically 
is going to make us more cautious about accepting the authenticity of the hadith. So part of ilm al-rijal is to look at the occupation of the narrator to see that is this is does the content of the report serve the interest of the transmitter? If it does, then we have more of a reason to doubt. That doesn't mean that we dismiss it, but that's something that we have to keep in mind when we determine the authenticity of or the reliability of the report. So when we spoke about the hadith from Aisha and we see that the main transmitters were from the house of Zubair and the house of Zubair, they were contenders for Khilaf after Karbala, it's not far-fetched to say that it's possible that they exaggerated their role in, in the beginning of Revelation where Waraka, who's, a fa- who's, who's part of their family, he was the one who quelled the doubts of the prophet. I, ho- I hope that makes sense. And thank you very much, Sheikh. Ahsan, Barakallah, Fikram, and inshallah, we will see you guys next week.